Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. And thank you very much, um, Alex Musa and Partha for the um, invitation here. It's fantastic to be here. It's my first time in Addis Ababa. Um, this works. Thank you. So I was asked to talk about Skin Cell Atlas, and I was asked to talk about it at the HCA equity meeting. So I thought very long and hard, and actually this was one of the hardest talks for me to put together. Um, and what I decided to do was to basically, um, essentially, you know, sort of give a personal reflection with regards to how I see the Human Cell Atlas and how equity sits within it. The first disclaimer is I'm not an expert on equity. Um, and what I'm going to talk about are entirely personal reflections as a scientist, as a clinician, and as another human. Views are entirely my own. And one thing I feel is equity is not absolute. There are kind of, you know, it means many things to different people. There's a relative element to it. And also there's an aspirational element to it. So many of you have heard about the Human Cell Atlas. And this is the kind of like mission statement that's on the website, essentially to create a reference map of the 37 trillion cells that make our body so that we have a periodic table of these cells. And at its inception, uh, where the first meeting back in 2016, it was very much focused on, can we understand what is our healthy human body composition? And that will be the reference against which we can actually juxtapose and understand inflammation and disease. And equity was always an aspiration from the onset because I think equity is intertwined with the success of the Human Cell Atlas. Um, and when we first started, it was essentially kind of like making uh, an inroad as this Banksy kind of uh, uh, image shows. This was basically us as a collective group trying to make our way within the Human Cell Atlas initiative. And within the UK context, Welcome provided the first bucket of paint, uh, for which we were very kind of uh, eternally grateful for. And we were just sort of trying to forge our way ahead in understanding the human body. So it's a bit of a dark and you know, difficult environment to work in. What we also did um, in the UK was to kind of like forge uh, partnerships with tissue repositories. And there were two repositories that we did this initially with, and this is the Cambridge Biorepository for Translational Medicine, led by uh, Kurosh Saipazi, who's also here um, at the back of the room. Uh, that's based in Cambridge, and also uh, leveraging the 18-year-old repository for human developmental tissues, uh, which had been funded by Wellcome and MRC for 18 years, and that's based in Newcastle and UCL. And one of the useful kind of like, a, was a bit of a, an aspiration of these repositories was that the data generated from the material will be made open access. And therein lies the sort of equity in terms of how the data can be used uh, from the research um, that, that has been done. And within the UK initiative, at least uh, funded by the Welcome and led by Sarah Teichman, who's based at Sanger Institute, there are many of us and from very many institutions. And not all of us started knowing exactly how to do single cell genomics, how to analyze the data, or even had the necessary technologies. What we went for was a technology that was going to provide us with reproducible and robust data. And we worked together as a big collective group in terms of learning how to analyze the data and how to make sense of that data. And, and that's been a big sort of learning and also training uh, a lot of educational components in how this has been done. And, and, and it's not where we have a centralized uh, unit in Sanger where we just simply send them samples. This has been very much a bi-directional approach where all of these centers also generate their data, also analyze their data, also interpret the data. And the number of individuals who have kind of like been trained and providing a cohort of um, researchers who are familiar with this technology and are able to harness its potential. And following Welcome, there was also uh, investment from the Medical Research Council and also for the Heart, uh, a joint venture with the British Heart Foundation involving six institutions. 
extending beyond the uh, original welcome funding with their science strategic support, and this involved 13 organ systems. And so one of the things that I kind of like looked back at the HCA and, and, and really tried to kind of think about how this is going to not just affect the HCA delivery and success, but generally a revolution in medicine is essentially embracing technology. And we've talked about the different forms of technology. And this is always going to happen. There's always going to be changes. Uh, and it's a question of like, you know, what sort of technology and, you know, embracing this technology to basically make inroads into biology and medicine. And along with technology and modern science now comes data, but there's a lot of biology that has to be interpreted from the technological advances and the data generated. generated. And really revolution in medicine needs external expertise, and this is fundamentally the approach. It's not going to be done uh, by medics alone, it's not going to be done by scientists alone, it's going to be done by a broader community. And this requires a change in terms of the framework of what is the research culture. And I want to sort of like bring up a point in that for, me, for a long time, the way we approach research has been very much one man or one woman in her lab. And, and that has to change in terms of how do we reconcile how you recognize individual contributions and individual success within the broader kind of like, you know, uh, findings and biological insights and research outputs for the community at large. And this really requires a team science approach, which we see within the Human Cell Atlas because it really needs disparate skill sets. You need the engineering, chemistry, genomics, computer science, et cetera, et cetera. We've talked about technology, we've talked about data analysis, and it's not going to be coming from one person, one lab. That has to change, and I think that's for the good. But funders and, and sort of the community has to sort of reconcile the kind of like individual recognition and, and success measure of all of these um, initiatives and um, uh, research. And also with that training, the next generation of researchers in how they can embrace this culture and also this approach, because really revolution in medicine needs collaboration. Uh, and that is what uh, something that the Human Cell Atlas has delivered. And really it has delivered an extended network of research capabilities, partnerships, community and culture. And we started off locally uh, in the UK uh, with, with that of the Welcome Program, and there are many parallels elsewhere, particularly in the Boston area uh, with the Broad, and you know, extending with all of the other funders, including industry, this can be really rolled out in, in a, at a more global uh, level. Um, and again, equity in approach and delivery is very much intertwined with the success of this program and also how we want to take uh, research in medicine forwards. So I'm now going to go a little bit into the biology because we've talked about you know, the sort of the background uh, research approach and culture. Um, and I was really asked to talk about skin cell atlas, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the development atlas that we do and also the skin cell atlas. Um, in terms of like the development cell atlas, this has been a big component of the um, work in the UK and largely because it allows us to also compare between adult and, and development and understand aging from that context and also making inroads into understanding human development, which really has been a black box so far. Um, and one of the work which is looking at um, the fetal liver and how the blood and immune cells are formed in the fetal liver uh, done by these three individuals. We have to give individual recognition for the collective uh, work that's been done. Um, and, and leveraging the kind of opportunities that you get from an atlas type approach where you can actually look at the system as a whole collective rather than individual components of the system. And this is very important because it actually tells you how the whole thing functions as one component. And here's an atlas. I haven't shown a UMAP. This is much more of like a animation. And it shows you all of the different cell states that are found in the human fetal liver. And it also shows you how the cells are transcriptionally related along a kind of a predicted differentiation trajectory uh, based on the computational methods used to analyze it. So here's everything. And one of the advantages of knowing what's 
there in all or in the entire liver with regards to the blood and immune cells is you can begin to understand emergent properties properties that you won't appreciate if you were to look at the components of a system but you will see as uh, demonstrated here by the migration pattern uh, of, of birds and this is a bit like you know all of those single cells kind of you know, the, the migratory pattern is only visible when you see it as a whole. And in the context of the fetal liver, because we studied the entire uh, immune cells and blood there, we could see how the composition of the fetal liver, the composition of the immune system, was essentially changing over gestation. And we may not be able to uh, perceive that and understand how that is actually hap happening on a kind of like a bigger landscape. Uh, if we hadn't profiled it as a, using an atlas approach. And then for the wider benefit, I mean, I think some people have talked about, you know, how, is, the, is the atlas about health or is the atlas about uh, disease? And, and by studying sort of normal human development, there's a lot of clinical benefit. There are many blood disorders that arise during uh, fetal life in terms of understanding uh, stem cells during development, which are supercharged, which can then inform us how we can therapeutically manipulate stem cells for therapy in adult life, and also exploitation of developmental pathways in adult pathology, cancer being a great example of this. And with respect to data equity, how do we make these findings more uh, widely available? And many others will also touch on this. Uh, we have the kind of like a repository where the raw data can be placed, um, and that you know is, um, includes the data coordination portal for the human cell atlas. But also there are many web portals where these data sets are available for people to just log on to the website and they can actually explore the findings, uh, making it uh, more equitable in, in some ways. And now very briefly onto the skin cell atlas. Um, and this is work by uh, three individuals shown here and is unpublished. And here what we've been able to do is not just compare healthy adult human skin with developing skin, but also taken two uh, common inflammatory skin disorders, eczema and psoriasis, looking at many cells and provide a map of all of the different cell types that are there in the human skin. And we can now begin to use this as a reference map to understand how skin ages and also what is going on in, in disease uh, and inflammation. Now, I wanted to use this example to bring out the participation equity. You know, the skin cell atlas that we have here, which is, you know, of all these sort of, um, you know, 10 or so individuals of, of, of adult skin, doesn't even represent the diversity within my lab. Um, and I was quite struck yesterday uh, when we were met at the airport, um, Kurosh and I were on the same flight, and, and the person meeting us said, you have the same skin, um, which made me think a little bit with regards to the talk this morning, how interesting that observation was, because superficially, yes, we may look to have the same skin, but Kurosh grew up in Iran, um, and then is subsequently now based in the UK, and myself, I spent the first 17 years of my life growing up in Malaysia, and I'm now based in the UK. So we have very different genetic background, uh, and there's a lot more with regards to heterogeneity that we need to capture within the kind of like global diversity. But this is not going to be simple because there are a lot of issues, eth ethical issues, cultural issues, and also personal issues, uh, which we, we, we need to sort of discuss and think about how we get a global representation within the um, atlas. And I guess we talked about in the human cell atlas, one of the analogies given is, the, or is that of a Google Earth of the human body. So you're kind of like going deeper and deeper, zooming in into the organs, into the tissues, into the cells, etc. But there is a sort of a broader, um, you know, kind of like a, a, a global atlas that still needs to be done uh, beyond that one individual with 37 trillion cells. And perhaps we do need a broader engagement on com uh, equity, not just within the context of this room, uh, with our local and global communities. What it means for the individuals who participate, the, the donors, their relatives, and the general public, and those who benefit from that data set. How can anyone contribute and how 
the human cell atlas will be informed by these discussions and, and, and respond in a reciprocal way. So I'm going to end here. Um, I want to thank Katrina Gohl for really sort of uh, steering uh, the community in the UK and making it into a broader network, uh, allowing us to sort of be more equitable in our kind of like approach delivery and engendering this kind of a research culture and also for some of the discussions uh, relating to equity, which has inspired my talk. Uh, and lots of people to thank uh, my lab and collaborators and Sarah, who primarily leads the um, um, Cell Atlas Initiative in the UK and our funders. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions? You, you've described some beautiful papers and the, the liver hematopoiesis paper was one of my highlights of the year, I have to say. I really thank loved you. It. My question is, how will these... Uh, studies develop as you add more genetic diversity? Will there, will there be a liver hematopoiesis atlas 2.0? And what do you expect that will look like as you add more than five donors? Um, no, I, 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 I think that's a very good question. And I think maybe if we stepped out of atlas, human cell atlas specifically, and think about what it was like when the, a particular organ was looked at under the microscope, say, for example, Ramon y Cayal, you know, and then how we've kind of added on, added on, added on. I mean, the atlas is very much a kind of like always a work in progress. I don't think we'll ever get to the point where there is an atlas final, but, you know, the data set is nevertheless extremely useful and will be a reference data set. For the liver atlas, uh, for the uh, fetal liver atlas, we had 14 individuals. Um, and again, this comes to a question of how much can you afford, how much more will you learn, where, you know, how much diversity needs to be captured. This is a start. Um, and I think somehow without actually doing it and finding out what is out there, we will never know. It's a little bit like traveling out to space. Um, you know, we'll have to kind of um, try to sort of see how much diversity comes into it. And it will evolve. And, and this, the, the atlas, you know, I've shown a lot of what was kind of like suspension analysis, but there's also spatial imaging and the integration of that information. It is an activity of diminishing return though, right? Scientifically. So there is going to be a point for that particular organ where adding more information in won't benefit scientific knowledge and maybe of limited benefit to communities too. I'm not so sure about diminishing return because I think we will add different knowledge. It's not going to be adding the same knowledge. And that's where the kind of uh, benefit for the wider community really rests. In the back. Uh, hi, Catherine Littler from uh, WHO. I have to get that right. I keep wanting to say my old place, especially when this is funded where I used to work. Um, great talk. Great Thank talk. You. Really interesting. Um, what I can't quite get my head around, and I suspect what Alex alluded to is we'll have this discussion at the end of the day, is this is a great standalone consortium in its own right. But how does that fit in the bigger picture of HCA? So what is it about this consortium and all these great bits of science that I'm pretty sure I'm going to hear about today that make them part of this bigger ethos? Um, it's kind of a chicken and egg question. Um, and that's where do you start? Do you, just, do you start with the science and then extract your values from that? Or do you start as a consortium with some foundational principles for which you look at the technology, you look at the science, you look at the culture you want to create. Um, but I think you could start to extract, I think that's what I'm trying to say, out of these presentations, we could extract some of the principles yeah. um, that will, should be the foundational principle. So I guess, yeah, my, my concern is, is when do we define the principles or how do we do that? Is that done at the end of this meeting over a long period of time or should we be thinking about it as we're listening to each of these talks? Because I think what, from what you said, you've already thought through what some of them should be, but how do we build them in systematically into this greater good? So I think it's, you know, hindsight is a great benefit. I mean, a lot of what I'm saying now is kind of like looking back retrospectively, but prospectively, it wasn't that clear. And I think we have to do both at the same time. I mean, this is, 
we don't see ourselves as a standalone consortium. This was how we kind of like implemented it within the kind of uh, local context. And, and it's, uh, it has many parallels. And it'll be the same uh, in Boston area and it'll be the same in, in kind of like Asia. Um, and this was just sharing some of our reflections and some of the lessons we've learned. Um, and, and all of these basically plug in to the broader Human Cell Atlas Consortium because together we actually bring new information, new knowledge for the benefit of mankind. And I won't just stop there. I don't think this is just about HCA. I think this is really about how we go about really revolutionizing medicine. You know, personalized medicine, it really needs all of these kind of like approaches and culture. It might not be called human cell atlas, but really, you know, it is broader than the human cell atlas. I, I just want to say on top of that, I think it's a fantastic point, and I think that we're at that point right now where the science has started, and if we don't start to think about the principles uh, at this point so that, you know, we constantly are having that chicken and egg cycle, we're going to get to a point where we might not be in a place where we have the principles that we want. And a lot of what we're doing here today is to talk about how we approach research how we can engage people, how we can do these sorts of things. You know, it was really beautifully represented by the talk that you just heard. Um, but I think that, you know, we've understood some things in reflection, but we've realized that we alone cannot uh, come to the right points. And so we're trying to engage a broader set of people to get more people involved and to really think about how we could use the fact that we're realizing we have to work as a source to do these things, uh, to really push the scientific enterprise and to push the scientific community and engagement around these problems. Um, great talk. Um, two things come to my mind. One is in terms of uh, the science that impinges on equity, and uh, the skin is a um, great, great organ to think about. Uh, the reason why I'm asking this question is that, uh, you know, we need to also start thinking about study designs uh, where both equity and uh, the science uh, sort of um, overlap and um, intersect. In the context of the skin, so if you look at the amount of variation that there is in cell types across individuals, there, there are you know, some sets of variables that one can think about. One is aging, you uh, alluded to that. The other is environmental exposures. And the third that I can think of are uh, genomic backgrounds. Like you said that you know, here are two people, one who grew up in uh, Malaysia, one who grew up in Iran. Maybe they were exposed to the same kinds of environment, but you take another two individuals from these geographies, they may have completely different kinds of skins. What am I asking? What I'm asking is that we need to understand the effect sizes of these various kinds of components that will add to or that will impinge on the diversity of uh, the cell types, and there I think both, uh, you know, the, the equity in terms of the representational diversity as also the scientific issues uh, need to be brought in, and therefore, as we discuss equity, we also start should start thinking about study designs in the context of equity. Now, that's a, that's a great comment, and I totally agree. That's what we need to do uh, moving forwards. I'll just highlight before we move on to Shine really quickly, this is one of the reasons that we're so excited about engaging people around the world. One of the things that was fantastic when we went down to Brazil and uh, talked to the scientists there, so there's a huge amount of genetic diversity and you actually get a lot of the same genetic backgrounds that you would see all around the world. And it gives you this opportunity to create these study designs exactly in the way that you say, where we could look at how different environments are impacting on the same genetic background to really understand how that influences cellular phenotype um, and overlays on top of it. So um, I think that doing that right and doing the study design right really involves engaging a lot of people. Um, just like we would think about doing you know, African genetic diversity in combination with the genetic diversity that we'd have in other parts of the world. Perfect. Thank you so much.